cast. We have uh, all been waiting for Buzz Aldrin, former astronaut, uh, chairman of the National Board of National Space Society. Excuse me, leave my notes out here. Um, brief bio on him. Uh, Buzz was educated at West Point, graduating with honors in 1951, third in his class. After receiving his wings, he flew Sabre jets in 66 combat missions in the Korean conflict, shooting down two MiG-15s. Returning to his education, he earned a doctorate in aeronautics from Massachusetts, Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Manned Space Rendezvous. This, the techniques he devised were used in all NASA missions, including the first space docking with the Russian cosmonauts. As we all know that July 20th, 1969, Buzz and Neil Armstrong were the first men to set foot upon another planet or another world. And this unprecedented heroic endeavor was witnessed by the largest worldwide television audience in history. Upon returning from the moon, Buzz embarked on an international goodwill tour. He was presented with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest honor among over 50 other distinguished awards and medals in the United States and numerous other countries. Since retiring from NASA, the Air Force, and his position as commander of the test pilot school at Edwards Air Force Base, Dr. Aldrin has remained in the forefront of efforts to ensure a continued leading role for America in the manned space exploration. To advance his lifelong commitment to venturing outward in space, he has created a master plan of evolving spacecraft system which makes perpetual orbits between the Earth and Mars. And in 1993, he received a patent for this permanent space station he's designed. Buzz participates in many space organizations worldwide, including the chairmanship of the National Space Society, developing future space programs and space education. Now Buzz, as StarCraft Enterprises, the name of the private space endeavor, is lecturing and traveling throughout the world to pursue and discuss his and other latest concepts and ideas for exploring the universe. He is a leading voice in charting the course for future space efforts from planet Earth. I give you puzzle. what it is we're talking about. 
Um, a few years ago, I had the occasion to, uh, to to look at what the Russians were doing with their big Energia booster, which uh, launched once, and then it launched their uh, space shuttle launch once, and I saw some interesting diagrams where uh, some of the Russian efforts were to try and make these four strap-on boosters for the Energia to make them reusable. And uh, I've looked more into the Senate rocket, and uh, starting about two and a half, three years ago, uh, with some other uh, engineers and some former managers who are retired, we looked into taking the first stage of that rocket and uh, modifying that so that an airplane essentially wrapped around that. We wanted to preserve as much of the uh, existing work that had been done on automatic uh, countdown and checkout of the Zenith first stage and its reliability, which until this last weekend would have looked pretty good. but. Uh, the Russian strategic forces uh, lost a Zenit uh, at a bike in the uh, Anyway, we wanted to wrap a, an airplane around that and make the first stage reusable. And uh, we feel that uh, the Zenit has a great deal of confidence in it. It's been chosen by the Boeing Company for sea launch. And uh, some of the other things that we have going on now are showed down here and the effect that this reusable Zenit could have on it. Our group thinks that the most uh, efficient application of this is to the uh, SS-18 rocket, or the, what's called the ICAR-2, and we launched that out of, uh, out of Baikonur or some other launch site closer to the equator. <clears throat> this reusable first stage uh, could be applied to several other uh, applications and eventually to uh, two SSMEs in a reusable, partially reusable stage. It might have a center or upper stage that then could make a crew return vehicle into a crew transfer vehicle. That's a replacement for the, uh, the Soyuz. <clears throat> we looked at uh, other evolutions uh, that could apply this to the uh, space shuttle. Uh, where we could put, initially, uh, we could put three of these star boosters wrapped around the external tank. The problem is that uh, the launch pad isn't built for, <coughs> for that, uh, for adding a, another uh, rocket on that one side opposite the shuttle. Uh, a good while back, for a number of reasons, I've been led into the idea that perhaps we needed a whole lot more thrust and we might have to use two Zenits, and this is not a commercial application because that's a very heavy booster. This would have to be a government-operated uh, uh, <coughs> spacecraft. Uh, we've since looked at stretching the Zenit tank about 20%, and we still have a thrust to weight of about 1.2 instead of the 1.5 that the shuttle has right now. And this would give us a slight improvement in payload performance uh, due east to what the uh, shuttle gives with the two solid rocket boosters. In other words, we could improve slightly the performance pretty much downstream of the assembly of the space station where you're servicing the space station with shuttle missions. And we could significantly improve the uh, safety and reliability uh, building a building block that could then be applied to a heavy lift booster either in this second generation, but it would begin to open up uh, the deployment of artificial gravity research, return to the moon, a low Earth orbit hotel, a second generation space station instead of taking five years and 45, 50 launches to put something up, we'd, we'd hope to put it up in two or three launches. <clears throat> and I think this kind of economy leads naturally to lunar missions, a low Earth orbit port, lunar missions, an L1 spaceport so that the lunar missions go from direct to the South Pole to reusable to a phase two of operation where we have a reusable lander and uh, then we uh, have a more capable spacecraft that goes from low Earth orbit around the moon and stops at L1 and changes the crew. That 
and with a second generation economical reusable booster, uh, we then can uh, begin to entertain economical, more economical lunar missions and Mars missions. You can study this a bit more in the uh, in the Ad Astra. This is another version that may uh, we may find uh, coming out. It gives you a little bit more detail uh, and, and words underneath of what this is. We'd be running this through a horizontal flight test phase while we vertically test it. And then it occurred to me a few years ago if we had a reusable rocket that consisted of an airplane and a rocket that went inside of it, either two halves of the airplane closed around the rocket or the rocket actually slid into it. When we test it, we're going to not have a rocket in there at all. We're going to have uh, developmental flight test equipment. We might put a cockpit in there. We're going to want the weight and balance to be appropriate. So when we get through the horizontal flight test and we have a rocket capable, we can now make the two together and have them launch up to Mach 5.5 and carry whatever we wanted here, maybe 50 people on suborbital tourism. And in my book, I call this concept uh, sky tourism. And uh, here we show the, the workhorse with a, uh, an ICBM reverting here. If you uh, were to apply this to the X-33, you'd find that you could, the X-33 would be a reusable second stage. It would go into orbit with several thousand pounds of payload, useful payload capacity. If we built the Venture Star, reusable launch vehicle, this booster would double its payload. Instead, we could build a, uh, a more rugged second stage reusable with external hydrogen tanks. I'm going to say a lot of things that hopefully will stimulate your thinking. I may not give you the complete story behind all the things I mentioned, but just like the, uh, the science fiction book that I wrote, I wrote it primarily to get you people to think created a lot of situations that hopefully you won't just take it all for granted, but I want you to think about things. And if we get out of here in uh, 30 minutes or so, uh, I believe Books A Million may be able to support uh, the sale of uh, some copies of Encounter or Tiger. <laughs> anyway, this tells the same story here of, uh, of how we eventually lead toward uh, a mature system of economical reusable launch vehicles. Now I want to show you a chronology of the future that as I see it right now, somewhere around the year 2000 we ought to have, following somebody's smart suggestion, a reusable first stage to go with a number of upper stages. I'm not alone in the world of skeptics who are just not that sure that the X-33 or something like it is going to lead to a significantly advanced single-staged orbit. Even if it did, the payload capacity would be about what the shuttle has and the smaller cargo bay. And it might deliver that payload that size very efficiently. But you can see from the space station how long it's going to take to assemble something that's sizable and how long it might take to put together a lunar mission. Let me remind you, a study was done one time of, of a single-staged orbit, Delta Clipper type, vertical launch, vertical landing, where the people had claimed that if I could put that into orbit, all I have to do is refuel it, and then I can send it to the moon and it could land vertically on the moon. Sounds wonderful. But if you read, read the fine print to that article, it took something like 70 launches of other Delta Clipper single stages to take the fuel up there so that you could go do that mission. You need more capacity than we're going to be able to get with just a single stage to orbit to be able to do things like have a destination for the tourists to go to. I really believe in tourism. I'm betting some of my future on it. <laughs> uh, 
because I think that that is what is going to excite the public because they want to get into space. And that's going to excite the support of the space program to the tune of when, when we really are looking for commitments and expenditures out of the government, as will be needed for exploration missions, that they will be based on the knowledge that tourism is happening at the same time. That's why tourists who get into orbit for one or two orbits need a place to go so that we can have them stay up there longer and bring down the delivery system to reuse it over and over again. Yes. So, a first stage reusable is a star booster or something else that's fully capable, not some small little solid rocket that can boost uh, an upper stage, but it has to be an economical, reusable first stage rocket. And with that, we can get some suborbital tourism, perhaps in the year 04. And at that point, uh, we can begin to modify X-38 hopefully into something that's more than just a delivered object to a space station that can be a light boat. That's about all it's being designed to do right now, to the best of my knowledge. The French and the Europeans very much would like a crew transfer vehicle to be developed out of a return vehicle. I feel that even more than that, whatever vehicle that is that we have up at the space station to bring back seven people now, it ought to be capable of being stretched economically to make a direct landing on the south pole of the moon and to come back direct. The Apollo command module could do that for three people and stretch a little bit for six. Uh, and that's pretty old technology. And whatever that is, these days, I think we know how to land them in places other than the big Pacific with parafoils and control, terminal area control with uh, GPS. We can bring a parafoil and bring uh, these not so elegantly landing shapes in for a land landing uh, and not have to uh, recover them in the ocean. So I think what ought to come out of these vehicles ought to be something capable of having the private sector develop the emergency return vehicle for the space station into a capsule that can take seven people into space with some degree of reusable upper stage. Maybe it's just the engines of the second stage that are recovered and the tank may be delivered into orbit for use in orbit as habitable body. But at that same time, we're going to be doing Mars sample return. Now is when I think that the first stage reusable can begin to put up an orbiting hotel with three or four star boosters, and we now have a reasonably economical, heavier lift delivery system. That's the same thing that's going to let us return to the moon, phase one, direct to the South Pole, using a crew transfer vehicle derived from this work up here. And we'll establish an outpost and begin to uh, produce lunar fuel from the water, ice, or from the oxygen. I think about this time we should be defining what this hotel is so that it contributes to the next things down the line, which is a L1 orbital port in other words, the hotel for tourists evolves into other scientific uses in low Earth orbit because it's delivered with two or three launches. And it then becomes, after going around the moon and back, demonstrating that we know how to do uh, lunar cycling flybys. Uh, I've got a diagram with nice colors that show you that. We then could move into phase two of lunar operations with a reusable lander that's adapted from the cargo lander for the inert initial phase of, uh, of lunar base operations where we go direct to the South Pole. We'll have crew missions and we'll have cargo missions. The cargo missions can be the framework that then 
is adapted to a reusable lander up and down from L1 to the South Pole or wherever else we want to go. Then some adaptation of a reusable upper stage. And that's where we need to, uh, to move into a uh, increased orbital tourism with a new second stage which becomes the orbiter replacement. Now, we begin to get into what I think is an interesting strategy. We built the lunar operations and uh, we built those landing systems to be able to support the Mars landing systems that are going to come next. We send a Mars or a surface habitat to Phobos. By this time, we begin to get our hands around a, a next generation heavy lifter with reusability. In 2015, we put Mars Cycler 1 into Earth orbit and do cislunar tests in Earth-Moon space. And it perhaps may have some of the variable gravity research that we've done back here on the first hotel that we put it into orbit. And we've been testing the uh, L1 moon port, and it contributes to the design of this. Then we send Mars Cycler 1 it departs for a Phobos landing. It's a dress rehearsal for a Mars landing. The HAB and the fuel units detach from the cycler and go and land unmanned on the moon. I assume that a good number of you know the components of Mars Direct and Mars Semi-Direct. Mars Semi-Direct sends an unmanned capsule on top of a fuel depot that is going to make fuel when it gets to Mars. That's the first item that goes unmanned. <clears throat> Next item that goes unmanned is an emergency, is an Earth return vehicle. It's sent to Mars orbit, where it stays in Mars orbit, awaiting the return. The third item that goes is the Mars surface half that people are going to leave the Earth, transit to Mars, in, and then land on the surface. And what I'm doing is combining all three of these into the departure interplanetary craft that leaves the vicinity of the Earth and heads toward Mars. When it gets there, the cycler, which is essentially the Earth return vehicle, detaches from the other two that are going to land with people in the Mars surface half and the Mars ascent stage with the fuel depot. We have a choice. Which one do we want to land most, most of the people that mutually support them? <clears throat> uh, let me explain a little bit of what, what I mean by these uh, Earth to Mars cyclers. I uh, worked at, with JPL I have to give them a certain amount of credit, though they, they never really said it was uh, the best way to go. And, and I felt that if you have something that's going back and forth between the Earth and the Moon, it's kind of hard to justify it if your sole purpose is to, is to support activities on the surface of the Moon. But you know, in the last couple of years, my pet subject is tourism in low Earth orbit. And I start talking about tourism to people, and they say, yeah, I want to go to the moon. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's very difficult just to get you in low Earth orbit. It's a big deal to get you to the moon. But more and more people keep talking about that. And so now I'm thinking, maybe there's a good thing to come out of these Earth-Moon cycles. So let me explain a little bit how they work. We probably start over here with three short trips available in a rough month's time period. We can send people on, on an out and back about a five day orbit. They go out past lunar distance, but the moon isn't there now. The moon's somewhere around here. And it's going around the Earth. So we send the purple one out I well, we send a green one out here, that's label number one. And it comes back and people get on. 
That's the low cost cis lunar trip. Then we have a second low cost that goes out and does the same thing, and the moon's not here anymore, it's over here. And the next time we get people on it, then it goes out, and now they do a figure eight and go around the moon and come back again and get off. So it's one, two, three. <clears throat> now that orbit going out and around like this has now established the cycler on, on this kind of an orbit about a five-day orbit. So we've got two five-day I mean two five days out, I'm sorry, and about a ten day out and back. Ten days out and back is about twenty days and seven days makes a lunar cycle. <coughs> so we can go out here um, on two of these missions and then back into another around the back side of the moon and back again. This is, I think, a reasonable candidate to look at as something that is a precursor to getting people to Mars. And we have several options for maybe twice as much as the ticket for a week in low Earth orbit, whatever that ends up being. I don't know what the starting numbers are. Maybe they're 50,000 for a flight into low Earth orbit for several orbits. Maybe it's 100,000. The market surveys seem to indicate that we still have thousands of people who would be interested in doing that. But they're not you and I. They're wealthy people. They're people that can afford that. And there are a lot of them. And if they can afford to do that, maybe for one and a half times as much, they can spend a week in low Earth orbit, maybe twice as much as the basic low Earth orbit ticket. Of course, as the years go by, the price is going to come down because we've got more and more of these vehicles uh, up there doing this. But now's probably a good idea and a good time to introduce the subject of share space. Those of you who've read Encounter with Tiber and a few other things in <coughs> Ad Astra know that I've had an idea for about 10, 12 years now of trying to spread around the opportunities to fly in space, not just to the wealthy, but to the fortunate, to the lucky, to the lottery winners. We kept, when the National Commission on Space did its, uh, not town hall meetings, but they were, uh, they were samplers of public opinion in different parts around the country. They, distinctly were impressed with the number of people that kept saying, we really want to participate, we want to get into space somehow. And occasionally they said, why don't we, have you ever thought about doing a lottery? Well, and NASA isn't quite the organization that's going to do a lottery, and all of that. But it got me thinking. I won't claim that I was the first one to think about it, but I have been the one over the years to try and mature that idea into something that's more lasting, more acceptable to the various critics. <coughs> dollars every week almost in a lot of states. I look at look in the paper. But not only do they have one big winner, but they've got a large number of hundred thousand dollar winners, an even larger number of five hundred dollar winners. I recognize that we can't just have one or two people getting a ride in space. We've got to have thousands of space-related prizes. An autographed picture of an astronaut, that's a big prize. <laughs> Go and visit space camp. <laughs> Go see uh, Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> Zero gravity flights. Adventure travel, things that spur people's imagination. Maybe jumping out of an airplane with a parachute flying uh, in the big 29. I got lucky last August, I went diving in a three-man submersible down to the Titanic. That's different stuff. That's adventure. And I've been going on uh, airplane trips that, that take first-class people, about 80 people in a 757, around the world in three weeks, stopping at nine different exotic places. And these are very popular. And they're the forerunners of space tourism. 
And that's why I'm going and giving lectures on trips like that. That's why I'm this year on uh, at least four Cunard cruises. Because it's these operators and these people, these type of people, who next step are going to be the ones that want to go into space. I'll get to the, I'll get to this a little later. But the person who is running that private jet around the world also runs trips on the Trans-Siberian Railroad from uh, Beijing to uh, to Moscow. He's also the same guy that uh, formed uh, Space Expeditions about 15 years ago. T. C. Schwartz. And he offered rides into space for fifty thousand uh, dollars fifteen years ago. And a lot of people put in down payments, but that was kind of a little bit before the Challenger accident. And after that, we also looked a little more closely at the design of, of that single stage Phoenix vehicle, and it looked like it was a little bit more ambitious than we were quite ready for at that time. But anyway, these people have had these ideas for a long time. I think that there are eventual ways for prize winners to get a flight around the moon and back after we've been operating in low Earth orbit for five years or so. We start to graduate and we can use cycling hotels, maybe with artificial gravity. And they're all contributing to exploration. What I'm showing you here is uh, the orbit of Mars and the orbit of the Earth. And we start out here in uh, 22nd of May, 2016. Uh, Earth and Mars line up. That's called opposition. You line with Sun, Earth, Mars, called opposition. occurs about every 26 months. And what happens from this point? The Earth gets going faster than Mars, so it gets ahead of it. By the time the Earth is going around once, Mars is somewhere over here sort of almost the opposite sides of the sun. By the time the Earth is going around twice now, Mars is still ahead of it. See, initially it was behind, but, but now it's, uh, it's ahead of it as Earth is trying to catch up. So with the Earth here after two revolutions and Mars here after a little bit more than one revolution, they finally catch up over here 26 months later on the 22nd of July, 2018. And we know these dates in the future to the second. Unbelievable. I have to give it to these astronomers. They really know, uh, know how to compute these things. And, and that's why we know eclipses, solar eclipses, lunar eclipses. So these are the months of the year around here. And these are the different oppositions that occur. And when you notice that it goes almost uh, seven times before it uh, repeats itself in about 15 years. So what should we be doing? What does this mean? Well, it means that uh, we probably should have left Earth here in January or February of 2016 and be almost halfway there when we get here, maybe get over to Mars somewhere in here after opposition. When Earth goes underneath Mars, we should have already been en route traveling from Earth <coughs> to Mars. Likewise, we probably should have left Mars somewhere over here to get over to Earth here because it should be en route at this time. But since we're not there already, we're talking about this opposition maybe for coming home. So let me put this next uh, diagram on. Well, wait. Before I do that, that's really kind of hard for me. This is a lot of easier. Not that one. <laughs> All right. Matter of fact, we're even calling this the platypus. <laughs> Got a tail here. <laughs> it's it's easier for people to to see the sun in the center and the Earth here all the time. 
Mars here all the time. We know it doesn't stay that way. But you can see what's going on a little bit better. If you're at the Earth and you know that sometimes the sun's up somewhere in the sky and the Mars is out somewhere. So what we're going to do is travel about six months going Earth to Mars. And, and uh, this is the opposition point that I mentioned. It's about in the middle of the transit. Now let's say, let's take the point where we're at Mars and we come back and we're going to get to the Earth, coming back from Mars, four months after opposition. Now all the incoming energy, the velocity that we have, coming from Mars, we want to save that so we don't have to destroy it with an air brake or with fuel to slow it down to be in orbit around the Earth. So what we're going to do is we're going to bend that orbit so that it's perpendicular to the ecliptic plane. The ecliptic plane is the plane of the Earth going around the sun. And we're coming back from Mars, and we come back with this excess energy, so we're going to swing around the Earth and get our velocity going this way. So six months later, we're going to come back again. We've got, we've got two planes, and one is at an angle to the other, and it goes through the sun. So it's six months apart on either side. So if we get out of plane, we're going to come over high, let's say above the Earth's orbit. Six months later, we're going to swing by. When we're coming back here, we're going to swing out. And six months later, we'll come back by the Earth again. And then six months later again, we'll do the same thing on the other side now, if we flipped it. We'll come back and uh, miss the Earth again. So at the end of 18 months, we'll come back and we'll Swing it by the Earth now. Right? The sum of 4 plus 18 is uh, 22. We're exactly four months before the next opposition. Lo and behold, we take all this velocity, put it back into the direction it takes us back to Mars again. Turns out we can do the same thing at Mars if the point of arrival and departure from Mars is just about one Mars revolution apart. That's why I've shown here that we can come here and swing by and go out about 11 months, swing out another 11 months, and now we come back and we can leave Mars and head on back to Earth. This is a much more satisfactory uh, cycling orbit than, uh, than one that you may have been familiar with a while back when I first came out with these. And it looks like a lot of the marks came off of that. I I've got it. cycling orbits that I developed 11, 12 years ago. It uh, started like this, you went out, and five months later you reached Mars and you went way out here, and 21 months later you came by, and this next time you, you depart Earth here and reach over here. So you have a cycler that goes out this way, and the next time is this way. At the same time, you uh, have another cycler that comes by, swings by Mars here, so while this one is going one to three, two occurs before three, so two to four brings you back again. And then you go out on this orbit, come around here, and you come back to Earth the next time. And this was cited as a very remarkable discovery by the National Commission on Space. And in the last 10 years, I've been refining this and uh, working ways to make this more operationally acceptable, and what I've finally come up with is this uh, out of plane where we swing by the Earth for 18 months between uh, departure and arrival. And what I feel we can do, if we just go back now to the We can have 
have the first Mars mission that takes humans to go and land at Phobos and conduct a dress rehearsal of a Mars landing, then 20 to 22 months later, that crew comes back and the next crew departs in 2018, goes to Phobos, and then, for real this time, dispatches people that land in the land. They may leave some people at Phobos. These are all things that kind of need to be worked out. But I believe by the time we send the second crew to Mars, if we've gone to Phobos and established all the fallback positions, hopefully that second group that goes, instead of all of them coming back after the 22 months that they've been there, some of them can stay over and we can have permanence. Otherwise, if you remember, you have to leave Mars about four months before the next crew arrives at the surface of Mars. And it's vacant. Nobody's doing anything. You have to close up everything. That's not too good. But what it means is that the normal rotation is you don't come back at the first opportunity. You go and you stay, and now you become the senior people at Mars. And, uh, well, you're the junior first, and the senior guys go home. And um, so you end up with about a six-year, five to six-year tour of duty. A lot of these things are going to take uh, a lot of working over and a lot of massaging, but uh, I've never been so confident really in my life that I've got three projects that are moving a lot more toward acceptability. The first one is a reusable first stage rocket. The reason that we don't have a first reusable first stage now is for the last 20 years, expendable throwaway rockets have been perfected by different companies to the point where they're quite efficient, but they're not cost effective. Okay, and they're multi-stage, two and three stages to lower Earth orbit or to geosynchronous. So now somebody comes along and says, I want to compete with you guys, you seven or eight rocket companies around the world, the Chinese, French, Japanese, a couple of Russian companies, and a couple here. Somebody comes along and says, I want to compete with you, and I'm going to come up with a reusable first stage. It's going to be a little less payload. It's going to cost a good bit more at first. And it's going to take longer. My competition is going to eat me alive. There's no way anybody's going to be attracted to do that unless you take something that already exists and you make that reusable. And you get the work done where it's a lot cheaper over in, uh, in Russia. Then it becomes something attractive, and now the American companies will pick it up and begin to do that. I really feel that we're on the verge of discovering that we need two-stage reusable, and the first thing that we need is that first stage reusable. We'll come along with the second stage eventually, and they'll, they'll learn tremendously from X-33, X-34, and other things that we're defining. Tourism is going to drive exploration, I believe, because, again, we need a place for the tourists to go, and we can't take five years to put up the hotel. If we define the hotel correctly, it can be a cislunar, an Earth-Moon cycler, and it leads to the how we get to Mars in a more efficient way. And rather than just have tourists, the wealthy people, we've got to come up with something that spreads around the opportunities. These different ideas are just uh, ones that are making me very excited these days uh, to, to feel that I'm creating something out of imagination and experience and thinking creatively as to what, what is it we really need and then trying to go about developing those things. And uh, I hope that I'm around to see a lot of these things happen. Um, I think that what we need to do is to define a bit more what we want in the next couple of years this summer, we're going to see July 4th, Pathfinder land. We're going to see Sojourner, I mean, uh, Surveyor, taking better pictures. We're going to see a number of other 
uh, robotic flights going. We'll start with the space station. And uh, I think we're going to be resolving what is our next generation, whether it's a, it's a liquid flyback booster for the shuttle or a single stage. It's got to be one or the other. We can't just sit around and do nothing. If it isn't single stage, then probably whatever the liquid flyback booster is for the shuttle, it makes it safer and more economical than we've been able to do it now. That reusable flyback booster for the shuttle is a wonderful reusable first stage. And it would do wonders in the commercial market. Imagine that you're on a, in a classroom. This is called an imaginary trip. Imagine that you're in a classroom in a lecture hall in a city on a planet 26 light years from Earth. And let's say in the planetary system of the summer star Vega. That's the one that we get the movie about, the summer contact. 26 light years away. However, you're in this classroom, in this lecture hall, in the years 2497. Your instructor is identifying on the hologram the original world of the human race. He points to Sol, and then he focuses on the third planet from the sun, the Earth. It's a brilliant jewel of a world. with a magnificent moon, no longer desolate, but it's now inhabited with industry. It's almost a twin planet system. The beauty of these worlds takes your breath away. Your instructor be continues to speak. It was only five centuries ago that humanity first stepped off the planet Earth onto another world. That world was the Earth's only moon, and looking back, the step Seems to be a small one. Only 400,000 <laughs> plus kilometers, just a little over what light travels in one second. But until that time, humanity was not able to leave the Earth. It didn't have the knowledge or the means. That moment was the most important moment in our history, the time when it became possible to explore beyond the surface of that single planet to realize our destiny of sending life to cold and empty worlds. What a time to have been alive. What I wouldn't give to have been there on Earth at that time. Just think of the adventure, the vision, the sense of destiny that surely must have existed when humanity first set foot on another world then, after a brief wait, to venture out again to settle the universe. Now these are the thoughts and feelings that countless future generations will have, may have, as they think back on the second half of the 20th century. As Mecca is to Muslim, Jerusalem is to many Christians and Jews, so the earth may become to the future generations of humanity, the place from which they sprang, the holiest of holy Genesis. You're here at that very moment. And this is just the beginning. Thanks a lot.
but that's not that's not true. I, I'm sure that that could have been a, a good marketing uh, scheme. Um, I think we've had our hands full with uh, with a lot of other. Um, what would what would we uh, what would our prices be? You suppose. Or well, some of them already. I'm thinking uh, a cheaper price is an L and B. They're only a few thousand dollars. <laughs> The, the first joint meeting of NASA and the Space Transportation Association, STA, I'm not sure whether you know that that organization even exists, it's the major aerospace companies who have launch rockets, they're the Space Transportation Association, it's some of the same people that formed the High Frontier Organization uh, uh, that uh, General Danny Graham formed. Anyway, the Space Transportation Association and NASA got together February and had uh, one of their first uh, meetings, workshops, on space tourism. And that report will be out pretty soon. I went to another meeting in, in Bremen, Germany um, last March on the same subject. We had people from different parts of the world there. The Space Tourism Society is being formed now it's going to have its first uh, meeting in uh, early December out on the West Coast. The X Prize is going to have a big dinner in September, September 27th. These are things that are happening that are the building blocks toward the, the tourism. And I think we're going to start defining just what this share space maybe should be. And it'll encompass and broaden NSS. It shouldn't be tied to, to NSS, I don't think. Uh, because what we're looking for is not 25,000, 30,000 members. We're looking for tens of millions of members. The numbers of people who buy shares in, in the future. And, uh, and there's no reason why we have to really wait until we have identified the exact rocket and spacecraft we're going to be using. We'll be looking at some of these issues of when we should really embark on this. Um, but I just don't want to water down a, a good idea prematurely until we're really ready to uh, get it going and have a lot of get-rich-quick scams going out there, get a bad name, and then we're stuck for a while. That magnetic slide that shoots a payload at the Some of the ones I've heard about, the accelerations are pretty high. They get up to maybe 20 Gs. Uh, <laughs> to be able to leave whatever the rail system is or the mountain going fast enough so that when they... <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think they're suitable for humans for a good while. Uh, yeah, sorry. up there in lower, low Earth orbit for uh, a little more than a year. And I don't think radiation has been a real problem because of the protection of the uh, Van, Allen, Van Allen belts, the radiation belts. It's once we go beyond there, uh, the uh, background cosmic radiation seems to have people uh, somewhat concerned on the one side, and uh, then on the other side, solar flares that, that may occur without too much warning may be a bigger danger. We're going to need some protection once we get beyond uh, low Earth orbit. But, but I don't see this really hampering our activities in going to the moon. We're going to have better and better predictions on the solar flares by placing objects around the sun and really watching what's going on and having emergency uh, shelters for people to go into once we start getting the tour operations beyond. And, and certainly, that's one of the advantages of, of a continuously orbiting hotel that goes from Earth out around the moon and 
back again is that you can put the weight into that and maybe water really is protecting you uh, drinking water or, or wastewater is protecting you from the solar flares and background cosmic radiation. Um, artificial gravity is one of those things we're just not sure whether the engineering uh, complications uh, are better done by having major parts of the cycler or the interplanetary craft rotate where the Earth return would be in the middle, the half would be on one side and the fuel depot on the other and they could be reeled in and reeled out again. Uh, I've looked into those things, but the NASA headquarters people right now seem to think that uh, within the confines of a good volume, you can probably come up with some countermeasures for uh, relatively long periods, but we don't know that for sure yet. Yes? I have a two-part question, but it's real, real short. Uh, everybody else has been very good about uh, laying out price tags for their the programs that they've been proposing. Um, do you have any idea what this 20-year project or so would cost and where would most of the funding come from? Well, that's why I put the emphasis on commercial launch rockets that evolve into needed uh, components like the emergency crew return vehicle. Let's develop a tourism capsule out of that. Let's develop an economical two-stage reusable system. And then because we're going to want to go to the moon and not take 50 launches to assemble something in low Earth orbit before we go, we're going to want to have an economical but the way to get that, I think, is to sell it as a hotel. Once you've sold tourism, now you need the hotel, because the same rocket that launches the hotel will get us to the moon, and the next generation of that. So to answer your question about the cost, uh, it's going to have to be pared down as much as possible, and reusability is the best key. Not necessarily single stage reusability, but reusability and operational uh, suitability and volume traffic. If you're just going once a month, 10, 20 launches a year, you're just not, you don't have the volume to build a fleet big enough, but when you're going several times a week, putting people up into low Earth orbit, you've got the, the volume of traffic that can, that can do it. Well, they're clever designers, but uh, they don't know how to get it into orbit yet. And, and it was a very ambitious and novel idea to have a large rotating structure, but it frankly is a little impractical at this stage of the game. It may be something that we'll want to uh, move toward in the future, a big torus that's rotating around, but it certainly isn't the first hotel that's going to be up there. Uh, I think there'll be a large volume and it'll probably be the diameter of the external tank so that we can mount it on top of a booster that has that as the core stage. And it'll be a, like Skylab, it'll be outfitted. Well, how many do you envision? And then we'll, we'll put empty tanks up there that were used for hydrogen. We'll put those up there and connect them to the, the big volume that went up there initially. One. No. I mean, one hotel. In the hotel, in the hotel, how many would be? How many rooms? Or how many will accommodate? Um, I don't know. Fifteen, twenty people, maybe more. Then it'll it'll have to be able to take several plane loads, several rocket loads of people uh, before they come back down again. And if you can deliver one a day, and uh, 15 people uh, on each one, and they're going to stay up there for a week, why well, you're going to have to have 7 times 15 capacity up there, plus some. Yeah? What kind of domes of these are you talking about for your um, Earth, um, Mars, uh, cycler, once you start doing all these ecliptic changes for your um, shuttle, whatever you want to call it, from Earth up to um, maybe with this before it goes out to Mars? You're doing that as an incredible outer plane uh, the changes to be able to catch up these things. No, this, the velocity, it, if I have something coming back from Mars with a certain velocity, I, as it swings by the Earth, I'm not changing its velocity relative to the Earth. It's going to come by and swing out this way. 
So the velocity that I approach the Earth is the same velocity that I leave the Earth. Okay, but, but the, the guy who you're dropping off from Mars to go into Earth, he's, he's going to do the aero brake or whatever. That's right. He's going to he's going to come back and aero brake to a, uh, a landing. We're going to have somebody else, uh, a series of janitors and, uh, and and fixers, and they're going to fix up the hotel for six months. Okay, but, but so they're going to get on board while these guys get off. They'll stay on for six months, then they'll get off, and other people will get on, and they may be putting a heat shield on a lander that you brought back that's a reusable lander. They'll be doing a lot of maintenance. That's one of the advantages of, of having this system that you can work and operate with back in the vicinity of the Earth, unless instead of the earlier cycler system where it came by and had a significant velocity. Now, what needs the velocity? I mean, you, you can't get around it. You, you're going to want to get to Mars in a, in a reasonably short period of time, six or seven months. So you have to supply that velocity to as small a craft as possible, not the big growing castle in space. You want it to keep going, but you, a small lightweight interceptor is going to intercept that. But that's going to have to go into a, a very out of plane orbit in order to get it into no. to get up there. No, up there. By, the, by the time, at the end of 18 months, as I come by Earth, I'm going to bend that into going in the right direction. Oh, sure. what, once, you, once you're going back to Mars, you'll, you'll be back onto, back onto the cliff, going out towards Mars. Yeah. But if, if the janitor is going to come up there for six months or whatever, to be same relative space. velocity. Different uh, topic. Uh, you keep on talking about using the Zenith. That's got about the second worst track record after the long march. Tell it, tell it to Sea Launch. Tell it to Boeing. They're scared. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned it to Dan Golden. He says, oh, don't worry about that. They'll fix that one. But their track record has been really bad. Uh, seven failures out of 28 launches. But that means no fruit sets coming up. That's not the way I get one. <laughs> Yes. Um, any, any, have they released the, uh, how much the RV 170s and 180s cost, or is that a pretty hard number to get? I think I've actually got it in other things. Kind of when they published it, they're now building those in West Palm Beach. Well, one of them that, that's not supposed to work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a. I, I don't know the exact cost, but, but Pratt and Whitney is developing Americanized versions of it. The RD-170, of course, comes in some smaller varieties, half size or RD-180s. They're being built now, and, and it had a track record, uh, one try and one failure. <laughs> no, and there's a possible RD-190 that's one quarter the size. Um, obviously, they're going to be economically uh, purchased and bought because they're the basis for the uh, Atlas uh, a modified vehicle in the Air Force's uh, EELV. Of course. Mark, my son has a PhD. And he got it writing a thesis on, uh, for a RAND Corporation, UCLA, on the evolution of the Soviet aerospace system compared to ours. So, He's one of our team members, and there's a uh, former high-level uh, Russian official, formerly with the comparable in our country to the Aerospace Corporation, it's called Snimash. Uh, he's one of our team, and then a few retired uh, former NASA engineers and uh, TRW engineers. We've been over there, we've talked to Tupolov and other people, and feel that uh, as long as we don't have deep pockets, uh, we're not necessarily going to be uh, charged exorbitant rates. They're looking for work, and it's very good talent that's over there. It's only when the Russian government gets in and is responsible for making the payments that uh, the payments a lot of times aren't made. So you don't want to deal um, through the Russian space agency. But will you have that opportunity to deal directly? Yeah. Very much With that. Well, I can't believe I answered everybody's question. There we go. Um, I was wondering, I, I read the article in Adastra. Um, Wait, matter of fact, for next issue is continuation of it. What, what is the uh, projected thrust that you would be using on the 
We use we use the existing Zenit rocket with the existing engine. Buy eight of them, let's say, for a fleet side. Surrounded by a, surrounded by a uh, aerodynamic shell. I understand. What, what is that thrust supposed to be? Because I remember someplace in the article it, it mentions, I believe, that that is the most powerful liquid fuel engine ever made. And it's a little bit more powerful than the F1. Okay, so the F1A a that is not, has not been built is about the same as the RD-170. So it's a little bit eight. less than the solid rocket booster. So that puts the 170 someplace above 2.5 million pounds thrust at sea level. 1.7 from here. 1.7. Okay, that seems to me to be considerably less than what the uh, first stage of the Saturn V used. Which well, they, had, they used five of them. Yes, the 2.5 each. No, 1.5 1. 1. 5 5 each. 1. 5 okay. So this is 1.7, and that is 1.5 times 7. Times 5 is 7.5. Yes. Yeah, I think we're seeing <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was looking for books a million. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Are they? Yeah. Close by? Oh. <laughs> well, I'm going to go do that. Thank you very much for your patience.